The article discusses the connection between math and games. It mentions that many people fear math but enjoy playing games and highlights that math is central to many games. The article also introduces a book called Around the World in 80 Games by mathematician Marcus de Sautoy. Loathe. Loathe. Ignite. Ignite. Mathematical. Mathematical. Mastermind. Mastermind. Guided. Guided. Consequences. Consequences. This message comes from NPR sponsor Shopify, the global commerce platform that helps you sell and show up exactly the way you want to. Customize your online store to your style. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash NPR. Let's start with two questions. First, how do you feel about math? And second, how do you feel about games? If you loathe the former but love the latter, you're not alone, and that may go back to your school days. Eight out of ten kids in grades 7 through 10 say they are fearful of math. That's from a recent survey done by the tutoring service QMath. Our love of playing games, on the other hand, is so central to our existence that Dutch cultural theorist Johan Heisinger suggested we be called homo ludens, referencing the Latin word for play. But math, it turns out, is central to many of the games we play. It crafts the rules and helps us win. And one of you listening from Arkansas sent us this message saying how important that connection is to you. I love Mahjong. Rumi cubes, spades, poker, it all relates to math for strategy. That's how I'm hardwired. It's how I roll. We had a mathematics masterminds club in junior high with a fantastic math teacher. She ignited the flame. Thanks for that message. And that leads us to the new book, Around the World in 80 Games, A Mathematician Unlocks the Secrets of the Greatest Games. The book is a mathematical, historical, and global tour guided by author Marcus de Sotoy. He's also a professor of mathematics at Oxford. He joins us after the break from London, England. He tells us about the connection between our favorite games and math, and we'll hear from you about some of your beloved games. I'm Jen White. You're listening to the 1A Podcast, where we get to the heart of the story. We'll be back in just a moment. Marcus de Sotoy joins us today from London, England. Marcus, welcome to the program. It's great to be on with you. So Marcus, I want to start with a message we got from Houston. I love games and math. Spades, Monopoly, chess, solitaire. With any card game, you count cards. With Monopoly, you're trying to make the best real estate purchase. With chess, it's all about problem solving, strategy, and predicting. All math. Uh, Marcus, you say games are a way of playing mathematics. What do you mean? Well, I think at the heart of every game is generally a set of rules. And when you play the game, you're exploring the implications of those rules. And that, for me, is very much what mathematics is about. It's understanding the logical implications of a set of constraints. For me, mathematics is about calculation. I think that's the mistake that many people make. I mean, I think most people think that as a research mathematician, uh, what am I doing? Am I doing long division to lots of decimal places? And uh, no, actually what we're doing is following very much the, the logical consequences of a set of constraints. And so for me, a, playing a game is a little bit like proving a theorem about that piece of mathematics. So um, as you said in your introduction, so many games uh, depend on a piece of mathematics to understand a best way to get to the end. But for me, one of the interesting things I discovered as well is in making games, very often game developers will need quite a lot of mathematics to get that kind of perfect balance between a, a game which remains competitive right till the end, doesn't go on forever, mm -hmm. isn't too simple. And I've discovered some beautiful games along the way that uh, encode just a wonderful piece of mathematics, but nobody would know unless uh, you would. Kind of, it was revealed to you. Yeah, I, it, preparing for this conversation revealed something to me. I'm a bit of a math phobe, and have been for most of my life. And I know I was able to to really figure out when it happened because I had this moment when I was about in the third or fourth grade, and there was a math club, and. There was a problem you had to solve, but it was treated as a game. And I was able to solve the problem, and I was so proud. 
with that math teacher because of the way she framed it. But then my next math teacher <laughs> approached teaching math- mathematics very differently. And I, I that's when I started becoming afraid because it, it started being more about the calculation and less about some of the fun parts of math. I agree. I mean, maths should be about exploration and and making mistakes, going in wrong directions, correcting yourself, learning from those mistakes. And I think one of the tragedies of the education system is that we focus too much on getting things right. Uh, it is often very competitive. And I think that puts a lot of people off uh, getting to the answer first. That said, of course, games are by their nature very often uh, competitive, um, uh, but in a, in a sort of more collaborative way, I think. Um, and so uh, I think that I've seen in the education system when uh, things are introduced which have a mathematical element to them, which which isn't so obvious at first sight, but which is something people enjoy, like games or, for example, music or the history of our subject. Mm-hmm. That is a very powerful way to uh, get to those kids who aren't naturally uh, thinking mathematically, but love something they do. And then if you reveal, oh, gosh, but there's mathematics under, underneath that, then that motivates you to actually explore more and, and yeah, want to know. Is, is there a mathematical strategy to help me at Monopoly or um, Settlers of Catan? And, and then that really engages you in wanting to know, how does this thing work? Your book details a lot of different games from across the world. But before we get into a few of them, let's just define what a game is. You say there are six common elements. What are they? Yes. Well, um, I, I think this is actually a really um, difficult question to answer because actually Wittgenstein uh, where I talk about something called his language games, which are um, the 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 way we define words is not by a, a list of definitions. So you know, I might give you six um, rules that I think should uh, a, a game should satisfy. But what Stein said actually is that um, those will always include some things you don't want to be games and exclude others. So in a way, um, I I think that we learn what game is by using the word. And that's what Wittgenstein says. But I think most people will agree that one of the important components is um, that it should contain rules. Mm -hmm. The other one is that it should somehow be um, outside of space. So it should have its own almost separate universe. So it shouldn't be engaging with kind of things in our world. So although it might mimic things like chess as a, a war game, yet it is its own internal world. It also has its own internal time frame. So uh, somehow that's one of the lovely things. It's a, it's a real escapism. It's a bit like reading a novel where you just uh, descend into the to the universe of that game, its own space and its own time. For me, it's very important as well that it's with other people. Mm-hmm. This is a actually a thing we share. I think it's something, you know, we talk about video games and I talk about video games in the book, but in a certain strange way, I think those are almost like solitaire. You're doing them on your own against the, uh, the rules of the, the computer. So for me, a, a very important thing is that we, we, we share the game with somebody else, two player, three player, multiplayer. Um, and I think that's an important reason why we play games because you need a theory of mind. You need to understand how somebody else thinks. Um, uh, the the other uh, thing, I, I, I don't know how many I've got there. I, I think, I think uh, we hit five. So it has to be outside <laughs> of life. Um, there have to be yeah. rules. Um, yes. I think you, you see, think- as a mathematician, I'm terrible at counting. I'm really sorry. <laughs> What about productivity or or the oh, fact that yes. it's unproductive? That's, that was the one I was yes. because I think this is really important. Um, a game should be purposeless. There shouldn't be a point to a game. It should. Uh, I think you know many people have tried to explain why we as a species. You said at the beginning we should be called Homo ludens rather than Homo sapiens because playing has been such a key uh, part in our evolutionary development. And I think that's true. You know, as soon as we understood that the universe was controlled by rules. Uh, somehow that there was a science to it, then games begin to develop because you can kind of abstract those rules and make a little experiments before you go back to the real world. But I think that actually misses the point of a game. So for me, as soon as a game is useful for something, it becomes work. Hmm. And, and therefore, by becoming uh, work, it's no longer fun. And I think it isn't therefore a, a game. So I think, for example, the casino 
you should be only going in the casino not to earn money. Then it's work and it doesn't become a game. But you should just be happy to enjoy um, the story, as it were. And I think, you know, the connection between games and stories is really important. And for me, that's quite a good game has to have a good story to it um yeah so i think we might have hit six there we're gonna say we did (laughs) you you start the book with backgammon it originated in the middle east nearly five thousand years ago why start there well i think in part yes because it has very ancient heritage although the sort of early game is actually one that you can find in the british museum it's called the royal game of or so that's the the second uh, of the 80 games um but i decided to put backgammon first partly because i think it hits the sweet spot for me of what i think makes a beautiful good game and again actually that's another six things um so let me say why i think backgammon so perhaps we should remind uh listeners uh, a little bit about backgammon it's a uh, it's what we call a racing game so you've got black and white counters on the board and you're throwing two dice and the idea is you've got to race your counters around the board get them off the other side before your opponent does there's a wonderful chance to capture pieces if there's on their own you can jump on top of them and send them right back to the beginning again one of the beautiful very frustrating parts of that government um so uh, one of here it passes one of my first tests which is any good game should have simple rules okay let's be able to explain Let's yeah. pause there because we're going to go to to a break and I want to hear more about why you think Backgammon is the perfect game. Coming up, how a love of games can encourage a love of math. We'll be back in just a moment. Uh, Marcus, we were talking about Backgammon and you were starting to share why you love that game and the way it works. Go ahead. Yeah, there are six things I'm looking for in a really great game. Um, the first one is that it shouldn't finish before it even starts. Um, What do I mean by that? Well, I think that um, something like chess suffers a little bit because it's a pure strategy game. If somebody's really good at the game and a beginner wants to play, well, you know the outcome before you've even started. I mean, Gary Kasparov against Donald Trump is not going to be a very interesting chess match. Um, So for me, pure strategy games, it's very important that you match players up and that can be quite tricky. Um, So I, I think that they can often suffer because you know who's going to win before you even start. The other component is it shouldn't finish before it ends. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, that some games, the trouble is the way through the game, you can see who's going to win. I think Monopoly suffers from this a bit hmm. because actually, as, as your uh, listener said, she buys up everything that she can and that can put you in a very powerful position and then you spend several hours just bankrupting all of the other players so for me a good game has to have uh the feeling like anybody could win right up to the end so so my third quality is i think that a game should have a balance of strategy because you want to express your personality through the different moves you make yet i also think it should have a bit of chance in it to allow a beginner perhaps the the, the chance uh to win um so I, i think those are really important simple rules i think quirtle which one of your other listeners mentioned is a beautiful game because it has very simple rules you can understand it very quickly how to play it and as that listener said yet it gives rise to so many complex outcomes and that for me is the fifth quality it should have simple rules my family if i'm still telling them the rules after two minutes they're they're already (laughs) moved on to something else so um but i want the game not to just repeat itself because it's so simple. So it should give rise to beautiful, complex outcomes. So, And the, my final one is that I think it should have some sort of story. Now, that doesn't mean that we want goblins and castles and things like that, but a game should have a nice narrative to it. So there are moments of jeopardy, moments when things change and shift, a, a sort of destination that we're heading towards. So it, it is a bit like sort of Lord of the Rings in a way, yeah. um, that you start from the, the beginning and you, you're going on a journey through the game. So I think... For me, backgammon um, hits all of these spots. That it it involves dice, so there's a bit of randomness, so that a, a a player can can have a chance, even if they're playing for the first time. Yet, even with bad dice, a bit of strategy, you can uh, actually still make the things to your advantage. Simple rules. The game I, when I play it is different every single time. And although it's quite abstract in some sense, there is a narrative. The race 
all your pieces off to the end. So I think it really hits a sweet spot. And I think that's why, you know, it's one of the most ancient, ancient games going back to this very early game 5,000 years ago. Yeah, we're still playing it today. Uh, and that is a mark of a really good game yeah. if we're still playing after 5,000 years. I haven't played backgammon in years, but I'm going to have to. We have a backgammon set at my at my house. I'm oh, going to have to pull, yes. pull it back out. <laughs> now, I'm really curious, and this is this is... <laughs> I'm asking selfishly about your take on Uno. I ask because that is um, the game we always play at the holidays because pretty much every age can play it, though no age is spared destruction in this game. We were just like, pow, pow, pow. Like if you're six years old, you're getting a draw four dropped on you. But is there an actual strategy to Uno that you can employ? Because it feels like it's more about the luck of the draw of the cards. Yes. Well, what's your feeling, actually? I mean, do you have a strategy? So my strategy, it depends on whether we're playing with two people or if it's a big group. When it gets yeah. to be a, a group of like four, six, we have huge groups sometimes. It, it, it It's a little harder. The smaller the group, I feel like it's it's easier to, to play strategy. And my strategy is to try to play in such a way that the other players don't know what I have and to watch what other people are playing to try to set them up for failure. So if I, if yeah, I see so I think- the, yeah, so if I see the person on, on, to the right of me, that their cards are dropping and they're down to just a few and I have a draw four or draw two in my hand, I'm going to get your card count up as quickly as I can. Yeah, exactly. Now, I think that that's really the the heart of the strategy in this game, because I would say this game sort of relates a little bit to something like dominoes, because you are sort of following on from what's there and and you've got to see what's in your hands. So, I mean, I I think it is, again, a beautiful game because it is Again, so simple. People understand Uno so quickly, um, yet it's got a wonderful dynamic to it. You can see a player just about to go out and then they're just unable to to put that last card down and then start collecting cards. And um, so I think there isn't very much strategy involved in some sense in your choices of the cards to put down. I think um, I would say, you know, put the number cards down before the special cards, um, unless you start to see that the person next to you really needs more cards right. in their hand <laughs> than use the special cards. Um, I think where mathematics comes in, and, and actually, again, it's about um, game development, is, well, how long is this game going to take to finish? Mm-hmm. And you might find, I find with Uno that it can take quite a long time. Yeah. And I think that's one of its um, failures in a little way, because, and we've done a mathematical analysis, and um, uh, with about three players, um, it can take about 150 to 200 turns. Right. Now, that is quite a long time for a game and it can get a little bit frustrating. So you think that's, you know, you've got to decide, well, how many cards do I want? How many cards is everyone going to get at the beginning of the play? How many players are there? The more players you get, it, actually the number of turns it takes to finish the day, game goes down by about 10 turns per player. So oh. I think it is a better game actually to play with with many people because actually because there are more cards out there, there are more possibilities of cards uh, going down as you go round. And so it actually ends uh, quicker. Um, well, well, but this the- is what where mathematics is very helpful in sort of working out when you're designing a game, how, you know, is it seven cards you want to deal them? Um, How many, uh, it's interesting. I think there are 108 cards in the pack, which is kind of curious because Quirtle as well has 108 counters. And again, 108 is a very divisible number. Uh So that is again, where maths might be coming in actually quite a Buddhist number. Actually, it's a very um, religious number in Buddhism, but um, I don't think that's a, a serious <laughs> connection. <laughs> to, to Uno. Yeah, I mean, in the way our family plays, you, you play until there's one person left. So if we if we start with six or seven people, you keep playing until there is the final, oh, right. the okay. final loser. We're, right. we're, we're, yeah, we, we take no, so our So it's not about winning, seriously. it's about losing. Right. Who's the loser? Oh, right. <laughs> I wish that's, you could just, that's harsh. It's <laughs> way harsh, way harsh. But a lot of fun for some of us. And a member of the 1A Text Club from Chicago sent us this. My favorite game is chess. Although the pieces do have point values according to their rank and capabilities, winning is based more on the right pieces being in the right position at the right time to checkmate the opponent's king. The only way I was able to win a game against an early computer opponent many years ago was by sacrificing my queen. Thanks for that message. Now, chess is originally from India, and it was a four-player game. How does math help us understand and play chess? Well, I think that... 
this is a perfect example of seeing what the logical implications of moves are. And I think that's what mathematics is very good at. If I do this, then what are the possibilities that can emerge after that? And that, that's why computers have been very good at playing chess. So um, in the mid 90s, we developed programs which could beat the world's best Garry Kasparov, for example. But I was very um, struck uh, by the discovery that, as you said, it was a four player game originally. And perhaps you can see that because when you look at at your pieces, you have two castles or rooks, two knights, two bishops. And actually what happened was you captured the other person's army and that became part of your army. And so, but it evolved into a two player game where they decided, well, let's just start with that, you know, the two armies joined together. The other curious thing about chess, um, and I, this was a real shock to me, it used to involve a dice. Right. So in India, they quite like dice, actually, um, in their games. They like the role of fate in deciding uh, things. And so you would roll a dice and it would determine which piece you were allowed to move. But when gambling was banned in India, they weren't allowed to use dice anymore. And at that point, they said, well, actually, we don't need to use the dice. We could choose ourselves which pieces. And and that's when it became the pure strategy game. Um, yeah. Where else do we see dice show up in games when you when you look at how games are played globally? I think one they actually have very ancient heritage. So uh, some of the very early things which have been dug out of um, ancient sites like in Harappa, India, are dice. Um, even going back before that, uh, they used knuckle bones of sheep, which land naturally on four sides. They're not symmetrical, um, but they actually made very good dice um, early on for these kind of racing games. Um, but then people started to explore different shapes for dice. It doesn't have to be a cube. In fact, that game that I mentioned right at the beginning, the Royal Game of Ore, one of the first board games, which is in the Royal, the British Museum in London, they actually use little pyramid shaped dice. We call them tetrahedrons in mathematics. They're, they're triangular based pyramids with four faces. Um, now, of course, when you throw a pyramid, it's pointing, there's a point going up, not a face. And so what you would do is color the corners and then you would throw lots of these little pyramids and count how many corners, colored corners were pointing up. So uh, the ancient Greeks, one of their great discoveries were that there are actually five different shapes that make good dice. And play Dungeons and Dragons will know these dice because they're the ones you use to to make your journey in, in those kind of uh, fictional stories. But yeah, dice have been so important to games right from early days. We're discussing how math and games are interwoven with Marcus de Sotoy, professor of mathematics at Oxford University and author of Around the World in 80 Games. We'll be back in just a moment. Let's get back to the conversation with this message we got from one of you. Karen emailed, my 11-year-old son has a very mathematical brain and he loves games. So I'm finding this conversation fascinating. He's a big fan of Rumi Cube and Mastermind, but two of our go-to family games are Toucan and Sky Joe, which both involve number cards and strategy, but are short and simple enough that his younger sister enjoys playing as well. We also heard from Lance, who writes, I put four Scrabble boards together and have 700 tiles. We have to make up some some different rules. And another of you shared this. My mom was obsessed with playing games. Every day when we'd get home from school before I'd even put my book bag down or had a snack, she'd be sitting at the kitchen table with some game or other and beg us to play. We also heard from someone in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who says, my favorite game is Go. It takes a lifetime to develop a strategy, and then someone may have a stronger one. I see it as an analogy of life. Push too hard on your opponent, and you will eventually make them stronger. Or get too greedy, and you will find yourself overextended. That sort of thing. I went to Japan in 1970 to see if I could get better at my play. My best game was with a seven-year-old girl who beat me easily. Her father was very proud of her. Her sister at age 10 was kicking strong several stronger Westerners on a regular basis. Now, Go, Marcus, is widely regarded as the oldest board game in history to be played continuously up until the current day. It's also proven extremely challenging for computers to master. It took longer for computers to to reach professional levels of play at Go than it did at chess. What is it about this game that makes it so complex? I, it, it is very simple because you're just putting black and white stones down on a 19 by 19 grid and you're just trying to su surround more territory than your opponent. So it seems so simple. Yet, actually, uh, you know, unlike chess, which somehow gets simpler as the game goes on because pieces are being removed, Go 
sort of gets more complex because you're laying more and more of these stones down. And what's the key to playing Go is a kind of pattern recognition, looking at the patterns and the shapes and the symmetries that are building up with those stones. And traditionally, computers found um, kind of vision very, very difficult. They couldn't recognize sort of patterns uh, emerging in something visual. So that's why... uh, Really, humans had an edge for for much longer than, for example, in the game of chess. But we've had this new revolution. We're all talking about artificial intelligence. And there's been a new style of writing code, um, which your listeners might have heard of, called learning. um, Say that one more time. You, You cut out very briefly. Yeah, it's called machine learning. It's where the code can actually learn as it plays and it try it mutates and changes. And this new style of coding has been very good at, um, for example, vision recognition. This is why now a computer can recognize the difference between a cat and a dog if you shared a picture. And that has actually been key to it looking at the game of Go as it develops and, and realizing what the patterns are that are emerging. But for me, one of the most exciting things that emerged from this is actually a new style of playing the game. Um, It played a new sort of move that uh, the Go Masters thought was traditionally a very bad move. But um, this uh, program called AlphaGo actually showed how to exploit what had traditionally been thought of as a bad move actually to its advantage. And it's caused a new revolution in the way that this game is played. Um, So I think it's really interesting because it shows that artificial intelligence might help us to do things in new ways and and be better for example at playing games and but at many things so i think there's a positive story which comes out of this i want to get to this email from peter who says i play a lot of dungeons and dragons good for you peter i love some dnd since tabletop role playing games do use math but can be much more focused on role playing or storytelling i was wondering what marcus's take is on tabletop role playing games within the context of his broader understanding of games go ahead yeah i think dungeons and dragons has a very important new quality to it because often in the past games are very competitive and you're trying to beat your opponent. But I think one of the things about Dungeons and Dragons, it was in some sense, one of the very first collaborative games. And this is a kind of new genre of games, which has really caught on. There's another very popular game called Pandemic. Well, perhaps not so popular after the pandemic, but, Mm. but the idea is that you play together against the game in you play together against the dungeon master, of course. Um, so there is a, a little bit uh, of a kind of competition, but I think even the dungeon master is trying to create a good story. And I think, you know, that's what's interesting. You're playing a role in this. And uh, one of the other nice things is that everyone has a role to play at some point in the game. So it's a bit like rock, paper, scissors. Rock um, is good at beating scissors. Scissors is good at beating paper, but paper is good at beating rock. So it's the same with in D&D that everyone has a moment when their strengths, maybe as a wizard or as a fighter, come to the fore. So um, that that's a really important. For me, I found, I, I did play this as a, a, a kid as well. And You know, maths is important in judging whether you should actually roll the dice and fight against something. So knowing the chances of of winning. But one of the other lovely things I found about it is that it's a a very safe space for somebody who perhaps is a little bit shy. I was quite shy as a teenager. Um, I found social interaction actually quite difficult. I think that's perhaps why I enjoyed maths, because it was a very safe space. Uh, I knew when things were true, uh, whilst, you know, human beings are, can be very fickle and you think they're doing one thing. And the, I, I actually, what I discovered is that d d is a very, uh, has been very good at being a space for people perhaps who are finding social uh, interaction difficult. Here is a clear set of rules which you're working within. Um, you're playing a character, so it's not necessarily you, but you can experiment a little bit with your personality through that character. So so it has been very, you know, neurodiverse People have found D&D a wonderful place to just to play. A couple of listeners also emailed us about, I think it's Mancala or Mancala. And one of you shared this while excavating in an Eritrean archaeological site. I saw our workers playing on an ancient board cut into the steps of a palace we were excavating. Is it Mancala? Is that the name of the game, Marcus? Yes, it's uh, Mancala is the is the right way to pronounce it. It's actually a whole suite of games. There are different versions of Mancala. And uh, when I visit uh, the African continent, that is one of the major 
strategy games that are emerged um, from Africa. And what's interesting is you go around different countries in Africa, you find different rules is uh, very simple versions just with two rows I, I mean one of the beautiful things it's very easy to make a mancala board you can almost do it in the in the ground dig out little holes and use stones uh, as your counters and you sort of seed stones around the board and capture other people's stones and, and basically you you try and win more stones than your opponent but there are more complex versions with four rows for example where you're allowed to reseed um at stones so it's it's a beautiful Again, a beautiful strategy game. I would say, you know, chess, Go and Mancala are three of the great strategy games that humanity has come up with. Now, the section in your book about the game Catan has what some may consider a very controversial title, the best board game ever. Why does Catan get that designation? Yes, I mean, I think it's interesting. I wonder whether any listeners enjoy this game. But uh, this game for me, again, hits many of the sweet spots I know Backgammon is a very ancient game that I think is one of the best games ever. This is one of the great modern games. It won the Oscars of games, the Spiel des Jahres. Um, uh, One of the reasons I love it is the board is made out of hexagons. So you place the hexagons down to make this land, which then as you play, you try and settle the land and build towns and farm and things like this. And it's a trading game. So the cards you collect, you can trade with other players. So one of the lovely things about the game is that everyone's involved in the game on every turn. Sometimes games can be frustrating because you're sitting there waiting for somebody to do their turn. For example, Scrabble, you might have your word ready and you're just waiting for several players to put their words down. And it's almost like three solitary games going on at the same time. Catan has a lot of social interaction, which I think is lovely. It involves dice. So um, you're, uh, there's a little bit of randomness there, but wonderful strategy as well in actually deciding where you're going to place your your towns and your roads in order to, to win the game. So um, many people have nominated, not just me, as uh, they believe this is one of the greatest board games ever developed. It developed, interestingly, by a, a German dentist. Um, and his name <laughs> is on the front of the box. And in Germany, this is very important because they believe that Game developers are like novelists and um, they want them to be celebrated. So they insist on the name of the person who made the game being on the front cover of the book. And people look out for the, you know, like new Stephen King novel. They'll look out for the new game made by people they've loved playing games by in the past. Well, we do have some Catan fans in the audience. Ryan emailed us, Settlers of Catan is by far my favorite board game. And Logan emails, I have found Settlers of Catan this year, and I'm hooked. The board is always different, which always gives you a new challenge. I just love it and play online frequently. I want to get to this message we got from someone in Charlottesville, Virginia. Winning is one of the last parts of board games. It's about getting along with everyone and even genuinely enjoying their company. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm thinking about some of our Uno games with my family. <laughs> and I don't know. It's really about winning for us. But we do we do enjoy one another's company as well. But when you think about, you know, how you approach this book, this intersection of history and mathematics and games for people who, like me, are, are math phobes and would love to just go into the game <sighs> Not thinking about math, but just thinking about the fun, even though math may be a part of it, or maybe thinking about it as a way of overcoming some of our math phobia. What advice do you have? Absolutely. I I think uh, the key thing is you shouldn't really be aware of the kind of skeleton underneath, which might be a piece of mathematics. You should enter just for the fun of it. Exactly. You shouldn't be learning anything from these games. Um, And so I, but the wonderful thing as you as you play, you are doing mathematics. And so you're exercising a part of your brain that maybe, you know, has closed down because of fear, um, but will open up because of the fun. Um, So I think that's what's uh, really lovely. Just, you know, find the game which you really enjoy. Maybe you enjoy a bit of chance and being kind of pushed around by the dice. Maybe you you actually like control and you want a bit of strategy. Maybe you like competition or maybe you don't. And so you want one of these collaborative games. And that's the beauty. There's a, there's a game out there for, for everyone. And it's like, it's like stories there, you know, different sorts of stories appeal to different people, the same with games, but the difference with the game is, you know, a story can make you sad, but a game can make you feel guilty because of what you've done in the game. (laughs) 
Well, we'll end it there. That's Marcus DeSatoy. He's a professor of mathematics at Oxford University and author of Around the World in 80 Games. A mathematician unlocks the secrets of the greatest games. Marcus, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Yeah, I look forward to playing with you again. All right. If you want to risk your chances at Uno, <laughs> you can take your chances. Today's producer was Avery Jessa Chapnick. This program comes to you from WAMU, part of American University in Washington, distributed by NPR. I'm Jen White. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk again tomorrow. This is 1A.